Welcome in, everybody. It's a special edition of Front Row. We continue with our Turning Point series. I'm Jim Donovan. It's great to be with Tiffany Tarpley. The two of us are standing in right field tonight. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we are at the Boys and Girls Clubs of Cleveland right here on Broadway, kicking off our coverage tonight. And we thank them for hosting us this evening. A very important show tonight. The coronavirus pandemic has forced many families to rely on the Internet to stay in touch with work, with school and basically with each other. But many of Cleveland's poorest neighborhoods, including those with the highest concentrations of people of color, lack internet service altogether. It's a long-standing problem. The title of the problem is called the digital divide. And the definition of that goes like this. It's the gap between households with high-speed internet and those without it. And it threatens as many as 40% of our city residents who could be left further behind during this pandemic. Yeah, and that is an eye-opening number, Jimmy. We are launching a new initiative tonight. Not only will we, be, we will be reporting on this digital divide, we will also be advocating for solutions. For example, our Computers for Kids drive. We have already collected hundreds of laptops, and desktops, and those are going to be given to children in need. So tonight, Mark Namick kicks off our coverage from here. I have to, like, turn off my Wi-Fi and use, like, mobile data instead of the actual Wi-Fi because it doesn't work. Like, I can't do anything when a regular Wi-Fi is on. 17-year-old Kendall Smith, among the more than 30% of Cleveland residents without home internet or reliable high-speed service. Sharing a household with six people, including her grandmother, she struggles to stay connected as a student at Cleveland Science and Technology High School, MC Squared STEM. For my internship, we do Zoom calls, and I was kicked out of one because I had bad connection. And so it's difficult to, like, have this internship and have to do everything online. The problem, not her generation's making. It rests with phone and cable companies and undemanding elected officials. One of two main broadband players in Cleveland today, AT&T successfully lobbied state lawmakers in 2007 to allow it to compete with cable companies, which at the time had exclusive rights for services in cities. AT&T promised competition would be good for residents, but when it introduced a new wave of fiber broadband technology in 2008, they skipped some neighborhoods. Glenville, Huff, Fairfax, South Collinwood and Clark Fulton, among others. Bill Callahan of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance has been monitoring Internet access in Cleveland for 24 years. He says the result is digital redlining, a reference to an old discriminatory practice in which banks and insurance companies ignored inner city neighborhoods. We called it that for a reason, because somebody had made an explicit decision not to make that investment in certain neighborhoods because of, because of their poverty uh, or the percent of people who are poor. Unfortunately, that also means that it was basically the uh, people of color neighborhoods. Old maps defining redlining resembled new maps developed by the alliance showing neighborhoods with little or no Internet access. AT&T has since made additional investments in the city, including adding fiber cables on poles in some of the poorest neighborhoods. But they don't have the other equipment in the neighborhoods that would allow them to provide that fast fiber service to homes. And therefore, they've still got 2004, 2005 level service. I believe that situation probably covers about a third of the city. Some households can only get internet with speeds of six megabytes or less from AT&T. Hardly enough for a conference call to consume a YouTube video without buffering or download a large document. AT&T says investment decisions are, quote, based on capacity and demand for our services. We don't redline high-speed Internet access, and any suggestion that we do is wrong. The other big broadband player is Spectrum, whose parent company, Charter, is a successor to a string of cable companies in the city, including Time Warner and Adelphia. It took over an infrastructure that connects most homes in the city, but its service is considered too costly for many residents. The price of admission to the Internet in Cleveland is about $64. Uh, and if you want decent speed in many neighborhoods, it's $70. Spectrum, like AT&T, still offers discounted services to the poor, originally a condition of their respective mergers. One emerging alternative is the nonprofit Digital C, which is building a network of wireless access to connect those left behind. It's using a ring of antennas placed on buildings around the city to offer 50 megabits of speed for $20 a month. It's going door to door to help people understand why they need Wi-Fi. It's about the kids, the seniors, and those in the middle we call the strivers that are under underemployed and just have to become part of this digital economy. More than one in four households in Cleveland lack any type of internet connection, making it the fourth worst connected big city in the country. Now, if there's a silver lining to the pandemic, it might be this. 
it has awakened elected officials and civic leaders to the troubling effects of the digital divide. Mark Namick, 3 News. Now, many students here in Cuyahoga County once again are being expected to learn at home this fall. That's a tricky task, especially if you don't have reliable Internet service or computers to use. And that's where a group of local business leaders stepped in. And Russ Mitchell tells us about a group of three men who came together, joined a nationwide organization to help those in need. Given what's happening today in terms of remote learning, remote work, uh, given what's happening more broadly in society around, you know, uh, systemic racism, that this was absolutely an important issue for us to kind of weigh in on on behalf of the business community and try to make a difference. Three major Cleveland business and community leaders coming together in an era of uncertainty. Bill Lacey, president and CEO of GE Lighting. Craig Arnold, chairman and CEO of Eaton. And Fred Nance, global managing partner of Squire Patton Bugs joining the PCs for People campaign. Their goal, to get students and families much needed computer equipment during this pandemic. In Cuyahoga County, uh, there is a, a divide between those uh, of us who have access to the internet and have devices to do it, and those who don't. And when our Cleveland school children uh, started to learn uh, remotely uh, this past spring, and as they will at the beginning of the fall, as many as 50% of them do not have that access. As we think about it in terms of having access to affordable broadband service, we think about it in terms of having access to devices, PC, desktops, tablets, uh, and then finally having access to training and having and the ability to get the appropriate literacy around, um, around how to deal with these devices. It's just tough to imagine for me today living without access to the internet. But for Bill Lacey, helping others turned into something even more after the nation had a reawakening about the wrongs of social injustice. On May 25th, uh, which also happened to be my birthday when George Floyd passed away, um, I uh, uh, had a lot of stuff going on in my business world. And to be honest, I sort of shut it out uh, until later in that week. Went through my conference room in my office, looked at the video, and I had to close the door. And, uh, uh, and it hit me. As I heard from the white community talking about white privilege, talking about systematic racism, and the need for folks to get off the sidelines, I moved from a place of frustration and anger to a place of hope. And out of that hope, I called Craig and I said, Craig, what are we going to do? Uh, and then it went like freight train uh, from there. And the group decided to take its plans even higher to city and county leaders. My first call was to the mayor. We talked about a few ideas around where the business community could, could help. And, and we landed on the idea of the digital divide uh, as the place where the business community could probably make the biggest impact in the near term uh, in, in terms of really moving this initiative forward. You three are members of certainly a very unique fraternity. Since you started this, have other folks signed on? Have other folks called up and said, hey, I want to help? We wanted to bring the private sector into it, to bring uh, business in a way that probably only business can participate. A lot of efforts that have been expended uh, from many different organizations, and so it really is a collective effort. The three of us think that this is a really important initiative and, and we're going to be accountable for getting it done. Now think about this remote learning. It really poses some challenges to families like having safe places for kids to go during the day. So some local nonprofits are stepping in to help out in that area. They're opening up learning centers. They believe that the actions that we take right now can have a lasting impact. Um, I lost a few kids as far as gang violence, street violence, and I think a lot of that comes from um, the kids not having somewhere to go. Amid a horrifying health crisis, devastating reverberations across so many communities. If they can't get access to, to regular digital learning, there's the risk to lose a generation of kids. As students around Northeast Ohio prepare for a virtual start to their school year, 
Many are facing unprecedented roadblocks. The Boys and Girls Club of Northeast Ohio sees a crisis shaping up caused by the digital divide and underscored by real safety concerns. Certain of our neighborhoods, um, it might not be a good idea for a, a kid to walk around with that gear. And having a, a safe place to operate from um, to, to do digital learning is part of the digital divide. Club leaders say they just can't stand by watching the at-risk kids they serve go it alone, taking classes at home. So they're pivoting their model to open in-person learning centers in clubs across the region. And we really think this, you know, this gives our kids a, a sense of community, uh, access to adult proctors for help, access to digital tools and digital access that they need, as well as meals throughout the day. With safety a top priority, at least 11 centers will be open for the new school year. And they're not alone. Other organizations are now following suit. Open Doors Academy, an education nonprofit that provides enrichment programming, has also set up remote learning centers. One of the things that we've learned in working with kids all of these years is that they rely on somebody, a mentor, and a person, an adult in the room to help them learn and to make them feel confident. And we know that there's so many stressors right now for lots of kids and families. And I, I see this as a way to mitigate some of that stress and to add some normalcy to people's lives and to the kids' lives right now. And there's hope the steps taken now will help students for years to come. I think overcoming this obstacle that we've all been facing and figuring and problem solving is going to help them whatever they do in their future because they will have confronted this huge challenge that we're all facing and they will have figured out a way to thrive in it and we're going to be right there supporting them and cheering them on. And we continue after the break. Teachers are also navigating the digital divide and right after a timeout how they're overcoming the challenge and what they're looking forward to this fall. Welcome back, everybody, and we're back on Turning Point, the digital divide. Now, you can join the conversation with us tonight by using social media and then using the hashtag 3 Turning Point. Online learning, okay, it's not only a challenge for the students and the parents, but the teachers as well. Yeah, and after a rocky spring semester, even an end to that a bit uncertain, there is hope this fall. I've taught for over 20 years, and I'm learning things I've never done before. The main issue is a lot of our kids don't have internet access. We're committed to finding those ways to bridge the divide and, and reach through the screen, so to speak. I had the chance to speak with some dynamic educators about their virtual learning struggles and how they're working to overcome them. This does not work without the parents. You know, the misconception of, um, you know, blaming the teachers all the time, it's not that, it's not that cut and dry. We, we, need, we need our parents to view us like we view them. And that's as partners. How can parents help you and also help their children um, through this time if they're doing that virtual learning? It's critical, especially for the, I think, the younger learners as a first grade teacher. I, I struggle sometimes to worry, is my student going to um, be struggling with the actual content or I don't want the technology to hinder their progress in the course, like because I need to be able to teach them to read. 
Um, but now we have the added step of learning the technology. Schools are having virtual open houses so both students and parents can become familiar with the learning systems. Has it been difficult to teach children um, in this type of setting or how is it kind of unique for you? My class was really uh, very hands on by nature, right? So that became uh, at least a, an initial hurdle that I had to get over. Um, and in the spring was able to create some videos and, and put out some content that my students could engage with that would allow them to get hands on with science, um, even from their own home. The soap is what actually makes that possible. I really am trying to keep focused on the opportunity because I think anytime we have a challenge, we also have an opportunity. Everybody needs to have grace with one another, um, that we have to have grace with, it, with ourselves as well. This has to be a collaborative effort between everyone. And still to come, these are the faces of students impacted by the digital divide. Hear from them and what it's like trying to learn without the necessary technology. You're watching A Turning Point right here on Channel 3. And we come to you tonight from the Boys and Girls Clubs of Cleveland. Jim Donovan along with Tiffany Tarpley. Last week, a very diverse coalition of young people put on a town hall to explain why everybody, not just city residents, should be concerned about this digital divide. And as Romney Smith shows us, these students are determined to be heard. My phone is shattered. I had a computer, but it wasn't working right. Together in a virtual town hall, young Clevelanders explained the very real impact the digital divide has on their lives. If I don't have a way to communicate um, or have Wi-Fi, then I'm not going to be able to do anything, like at all. That includes school. All CMSD students are learning virtually the first quarter, meaning all lessons, presentations, and turning in work has to be done over the internet. Virtual school directly links academic success to the ability to access and use the internet for class. They also realize that beyond school, 
a lack of digital access can have a devastating impact on their future. The digital divide stops people from having access to online health care, job applications, college applications, or even now Zoom calls. Through the nonprofit EYEJ, empowering youth, exploring justice, young people together with community leaders spoke with urgency about the need to fix the digital divide now. The message is you don't matter. Um, and it's not even you don't matter because of something you've done. It's you don't matter because of the circumstances you were born into. In the presentation, Ethan highlights a map showing the overlap between discriminatory geographic housing practices from decades ago, redlining, and the areas with significant lack of Internet access today. As we fight other standpoints of racism and suppression, this is the new redlining and the new um, form of oppression that will move in 15 to 100 years from now. Students say having internet access is a necessary factor to being successful. I would definitely pick internet over having food because I'd rather have my grades up than eat. EYEJ members implored community leaders taking part in the call to take immediate action. The intent has been great and the intent of politicians and People hearing us out is great, but it's time for them to make an impact. Closing the gap now so the next generation doesn't have to fight another societal inequality. If we don't fix the digital divide now, I kind of worry that the gap is going to get too big by the time we're like adults. Romney Smith, 3 News. It will be years from now when we'll see how the coronavirus changed the course of education. It's not the first time, though, that an outside event has altered what schools teach and how students learn. When we come back, Leon Bibb's message on how you can be a part of the change. Right now, we are truly seeing how remote learning is shaping the future of education. It's not the first time, though, that an outside event has changed the way students have been able to learn. And so tonight, our Leon Bibb is going to look back at that outside event, how it's impacted schools, and also how it's really changed the course of our nation's history. There is a wide gulf in Cleveland expanding in lightning speed. Its eventual impact will affect every one of us. The gulf is the digital divide. Thousands of children in Cleveland schools who for many reasons are excluded from the internet 
from Wi-Fi. The problem is more pronounced in this pandemic time where schooling is virtual at home, but if there is no Wi-Fi or little digital access at home, the student is already behind in education. When I was in Cleveland schools, the system was hailed as one of the best big city districts in the nation. The school supplied textbooks and other supplies I needed were in abundance. But today's computer world is far different. Add to that the pandemic. Education has been rocked. An outside event can do that. When I was a student in this public school a long time ago, there was an outside event, not nearly as severe as today's pandemic, which changed my education and rocked our world. The Soviet Union had launched the first satellite into Earth orbit, and America lagged woefully behind in the space race. So America said, those kids have got to have more science so we can catch up with the Soviet Union in the space race. More science courses were poured into us. It was an outside event which changed my education. Today's outside of it is the pandemic, and it's pushing kids whose school buildings are closed to Wi-Fi and the digital world in their virtual learning at home. One fourth of all Cuyahoga County households have no home-based broadband access. So question, what can you do to close the digital divide? Three things. Donate a laptop or desktop computer for a student who needs one. WKYC is spearheading a Computers for Kids drive. Personal computers are being accepted through tomorrow. There is more information on WKYC.com slash three cares. Or take a stand on Ohio House Bill 13, which if passed would allocate money for improving internet access only in rural areas. Contact your state legislators now to urge the bill be amended so urban areas like Cleveland would also receive funding. Make a financial donation to the Digital Equity Fund. Donate online at clevelandfoundation.org slash digital equity. These are demanding times. All students need to be able to get to the new world waiting for them if they're able to log on to it. For 3 News, I'm Leon Bibb. Thanks for that, Leon. Literally, as the sun is setting on our show tonight, we've told you the story of Cleveland's digital divide, but we want to leave you with a moment. This is powerful, too. A 17-year-old high school junior who lives in public housing got a special surprise, much needed, well-deserved. Let's go ahead and introduce you to DeMarco Haynes. Uh, he loves graphic design and always walks over to the Boys and Girls Club to use their computers because he doesn't have one at home. But now he is the proud owner of his own laptop and just in time before he has to begin online classes as a junior at Martin Luther King High School. His recycled computer was provided by PCs for People as part of WKYC Studios Computers for Kids Drive, which has collected nearly 1,000 laptops and desktops to be distributed to students in need. And you know, this has really become a priority here at 3 News, and that is the reason why we wanted to talk about it tonight on A Turning Point. And you know, the thing that I think, um, I don't know if guilty is the right word, but I think we take for granted is this. We all thought everybody had computers and internet, and now we find out they don't. We'll be back with another Turning Point on October 1st.